This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 2124. All value is perceived value by April Dykeman with GetRichSlowly.org. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. Now let's get right to today's post as we optimize your life. All Value is Perceived Value by April Dykeman with GetRichSlowly.org. A lot of folks hate advertising and it's hard to blame them. But in a 2009 TED Talk, admin Rory Sutherland argues that what advertising creates, perceived value, doesn't deserve its bad reputation. If you wanna live in a world with less stuff, for example, your two options are live in a world that's poorer, which most of us don't wanna do, or live in a world where greater value is placed on the intangible, which can conserve resources. Confused? It all comes down to your perception. Perceived value. Most people think that value is about making things, the labor and the raw materials, and that any intangible value added on top isn't real. That's understandable. You can't touch or feel or see perceived value yet it affects our actions more than we'd like to admit. Sutherland uses the examples of placebos. Quote, what on earth is wrong with placebos? They seem fantastic to me. They cost very little to develop. They work extraordinarily well. They have no side effects, or if they do, they're imaginary. So you can safely ignore them, end quote. Another example is Frederick the Great of Prussia who wanted Germans to adopt the potato to provide a second carbohydrate staple in addition to wheat. This would stabilize price volatility in bread and lower the risk of famine. The problem, says Sutherland, was that Prussians weren't big on vegetables and the potato is rather ugly. So Frederick made a law that people had to grow potatoes and there are records of people being executed for refusing to comply. This didn't work. So he tried a new approach, which was to declare the potato as a royal vegetable. Only royalty could eat it. He had a royal potato patch planted with guards who were asked to not guard it too well. Sutherland says, quote, now 18th century peasants know that there is one pretty safe rule in life, which is if something is worth guarding, it's worth stealing, end quote. Pretty soon there was an underground potato growing operation. The first president of Turkey used a similar marketing ploy to create negative perceived value when he wanted to make the country more modern by discouraging the wearing of a veil. Instead of simply banning the veil, which would incite anger among the people, he made a law that prostitutes had to wear the veil. Sutherland admits he can't verify the story, but it does not matter, he says. Quote, there is your environmental problem solved. By the way, guys, all convicted child molesters have to drive a Porsche, end quote. All value is relative. All value is perceived value. This is why all but maybe the top expert wine tasters think a more expensive wine tastes better, and it stimulates the parts of the brain that experience pleasure, when really it's a cheap $5 bottle of wine or the exact same wine to which they're comparing it. Impulse saving. Eventually, Sutherland's talk ventures into the realm of personal finance. He shares his thoughts on impulse buying, which marketing has made extremely easy, and the idea of impulse saving. Quote, if you had a large red button on the wall of your home, and every time you pressed it, it put $50 into your pension, you would save a lot more. The reason is that the interface fundamentally determines the behavior. We've never created the opportunity for impulse saving. If you did this, more people would save more. It's simply a question of changing the interface by which people make decisions, end quote. To get people to save more, Sutherland says, we need to think about fundamental ways to change human behavior. Obviously, being an ad man, his job is to encourage impulse buying, not saving. But it's interesting to think about how the methods that get people to purchase a magazine and Coke at the checkout counter might be used to get them to stash an extra $10 per day in a savings account. For example, automatic monthly billing is a great way to get regular revenue from a customer. Think about how gym memberships operate. Half the time people quit the gym and keep paying 
either because they forgot about the dues or they're too lazy to cancel. Many of us use the same principle to encourage savings by paying ourselves first through automatic deposits, which we know is much more effective than relying on willpower or memory to save every month. Wanting what we've got. Sutherland says, quote, we need to spend more time appreciating what already exists and less time agonizing over what else we can do, end quote. One way to start to place higher value on what already exists is through social networking. Yes, that threw me for a loop too. Facebook and I have a love-hate relationship. But get this, he says there's some evidence that social networking helps people appreciate what they have because it lets them share news and give badge value to everyday trivial activities. Quote, so social networks actually reduce the need for spending great money on display, he says and increases the kind of third-party enjoyment you can get from the smallest, simplest things in life, which is magic, end quote. That's true, at least in my social network. People post about funny things their kids say, a photo of the cookies they just baked, pictures of loved ones, updates about funny stories, or the things that are making them happy. Nobody posts shots of their new Hummer or boasts about spending $500 on new clothes. It's pretty humdrum, really but also, as Sutherland says, a little magical. Appreciating everyday trivial activities can help you save money. Another example is the evidence that past a certain modest income level, we tend to judge our happiness on a relative basis. This is why keeping up with the Joneses leads so many to financial ruin. Chances are that if your friends place high value on new cars and fancy clothes, you'll be less happy without those things. At the very least, it's going to be uncomfortable to suddenly stop spending money with your friends or to opt out of regular shopping trips. To change the interface and fundamentally change your behavior, you might need to branch out and find a community with the same value perceptions you're trying to cultivate. You just listened to the post titled, All Value is Perceived Value by April Dykeman with GetRichSlowly.org. I think that getting good with money involves aligning the way we spend all of our resources with the things we value and constantly questioning our assumptions around what is valuable. It reminds me of this concept of the American dream, which originated as an ideal where every person has the right to pursue his or her unique version of happiness. But I think many of us can't help but notice that it has devolved over time into something entirely different something rooted in excessive consumerism. I think that's why George Carlin once said, quote, the reason they call it the American dream is because you have to be asleep to believe it, end quote. When you put yourself in the financial position to disconnect a bit from the rat race, you open up space in your life to start asking bigger questions about your unique version of happiness. Rather than asking, how am I gonna pay my bills this month? Or what kind of material luxury am I gonna buy today? You can start asking questions like, how do I wanna spend my time? Who do I wanna spend it with? And what do I wanna create in the world? And fostering the ability to enjoy the simple things in life and appreciate the material abundance you already have is a step in the right direction to be able to ask these bigger questions. You only get one life. And I think a lot of satisfaction comes from being in the position to actively create your life rather than to passively consume while your life passes you by. And that's a wrap for another Monday show. Have a great start to your week and I'll be back tomorrow where your optimal life awaits.